it, I'll uh, say that Angela has uh, put in the uh, CME info uh, in the chat box uh, there for uh, if you need to do that.
here's the, the dosing schedule for enclisiran. So they get an initial dose, um, followed by a second dose at three months, and then every six months thereafter for maintenance dosing. Um, no adjustment in the dose is needed for renal impairment or mild to moderate hepatic impairment. Because of the mechanism of action, there's no known drug-drug interactions. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a plan if there's a missed dose, um, but very convenient, I would say, um, for a lot, a lot of patients. Um, and I, I have patients in my clinic that are on stable treatments right now and are inquiring about this. And I, I think it's attractive and I think I'm hopeful it'll be become more commonly used, but as with any new medication, we're just not there yet due to, due to cost, um, and the cost benefit ratio. There is a pooled safety analysis that was published. Um, this included all of the phase three trials, Orion 9, 10, and 11. Um, and again, uh, in general, there were similar safety profiles between glycerin and placebo. You know, they did see um, this modest, they said excess of self-limited and they were classified as mild to moderate um, treatment emergent adverse events. This seemed to be driven by either injection site reactions or a small increase in bronchitis. Um, but there were no differences between group groups in terms of liver muscle or hematologic labs or parameters. And then um, uh, this group did do, you know, they did do a, this patient level analysis of, again, all the phase three trials and looked at cardiovascular events and did see um, a reduction in MACE, um, but not you know, some of the components. They're not fatal and non-fatal MIs or fatal and non-fatal stroke. Um, but at least it tells us there, that there likely is potential cardiovascular benefit. I, I would say I'm not surprised anything really that seems to lower LDL seems to lower risk, um, but at least we have some, um, some data. Now, what does this cost to the patient? Well, currently we know that a single dose is um, $3,800 without insurance. Now, the, the difficult thing about Enclisteran is that it is, um, uh, it goes through medical insurance, not prescription drug insurance. And that's because it has to be administered in the clinic. I'm not sure exactly why that is the case, um, but as of now to prescribe it, it's gotta be dosed in the clinic. Um, so this increases the complexity. We can't tell the patients what, what it's gonna cost them. But we can, what we do is we do provide them with certain codes, uh, specifically a J code and CPT codes so that they can call their medical insurance um, with and get at least some sort of cost estimate um, for Enclisteran. Now, this is in comparison to our monoclonal PCSK9 inhibitor antibodies, right? So our um, proluent um, and our, our Repatha, these, um, we over 96% of our patients can can afford these now. Um, you know, when we combine copay cards um, with insurance and and costs of these medications coming down, um, they're very affordable right now. So you know, our approach in my clinic is is been you know if they're doing well on these PCSK9 monoclonal antibody inhibitors, there's really at least not right now no reason to switch them to Enclisteran where there's a lot of unknown still, especially in terms of cost. So that said, um, the current, uh, some of the current folks that are on Enclisteran right now, um, one example, I have a 58, a 50 year old woman with gene confirmed FH, she's on high intensity statin and azetamine, but has had allergic reactions to both PCSK9 inhibitors and has a current LDL of 200. So she just started Enclisteran a few months ago. And then we have a, another one is a 60 year old woman, again with FH, intolerant to statins, Azetamib and high dose PCSK9 inhibitor. So she actually tolerated the lower dose of proluent, but her LDL is not at goal. So we switched her over in Clisteran. She seems to be doing well on it. And then um, one other example that comes to mind I have a 60 year, 60 year old man that has clinical ASCVD, statin intolerance, is only on Zetia, and he cannot perform self injection. So he can't do his own, you know, PCSK9 inhibitor, monoclonal antibody inhibitor injections due to an essential tremor. So he's he's uh, he's on enclisteran as well. Um, 
my advice to you uh, for starting this, um, so it, it was a logistical nightmare to get it going in, in our um, cardiology clinics, but now, now it's there, now it's happening, just, just at CFAC. Um, but we have a protocol for it. So if, if you're interested as a division, I can always send that over to you. Um, but for now, if you do have somebody that you think might be a candidate, um, you know, please do refer over to us and we can get them going on it. Um, just remember, um, the big thing is this, this, because it is a PCSK9 inhibitor, this is not an add-on therapy to somebody that's already on Pralument or Repatha, right? They, they will not work together. Um, or there won't be additional LDL lowering. Um, you know, while Inclisteran is likely more convenient for a lot of patients, I think in terms of cost, um, it's still it's still not preferred over what we currently have. Um, another interesting thing, so as of July of this year, the FDA expanded approval of Inclisteran to include um, high-risk primary prevention patients. Um, so no ASCVD, no FH, but they are high risk, say by the you know pooled cohort equation, for example. Um, so this is a, this is this is a, a, a different, um, especially since our, our monoclonal antibodies uh, inhibitors don't have this approval yet. But but we'll have to see where this goes. I think it, right now it's a matter of um, payers and what what they're going to do uh, with this medication. Um, Bethadone acid, so we do have uh, another tool on our pocket here. Um, so this is the clear outcomes trial um, published this year. Um, Bethadone acid, it's the ATP citrate lysate, lysate inhibitor. Um, it's also an inactive prodrug and it doesn't get activated until it reaches the liver. So because it's a prodrug, um, it's supposed not supposed to um, result in myalgias or, or lead to myalgias um, or be associated with myalgias. Um, and in fact, at least in the clear outcomes trial, um, there were less myalgias with methadoic acid um, compared to histor historically compared to statins. So this was all in patients that were either unable or unwilling to take statins. So a very statin intolerant population. Um, but this one, you know, kind of like azetamib, you know, modest reduction in LDL levels, about 21%, uh, but still, it's it's something. It's still another option. Um, it seems to be uh, well tolerated in general. Um, you know, I, I still think there's a role for bioacid sequestrants in some patients, particularly in, in pregnant women who already have ASDVD. Um, maybe have FH and, and you don't want to, you know, um, not have them on any LDL lowering agent during pregnancy. Um, it's safe during pregnancy. It's also safe in children and approved for use in children. All right. So these are our two groups where, you know, when you have LDL, it's not at goal and some mixed in with some statin intolerance. So on the left here, we have our secondary prevention. They basically, you know, are eligible for any of these medications. Um, and I, I don't spend a lot of time on the LDL apheresis during this talk, but it is an option. Um, it's always an option for secondary prevention. And it oftentimes is um, easily approved and um, covered by insurance. You know, the big problem is that people just don't want to do it. It's a huge inconvenience. Um, you know, they have to get two IVs put in. They have to go every couple of weeks to have the LDL pulled out. Um, so, so it's hugely inconvenient. Um, and then on the right here, we have our primary prevention without FH group, you know, so if, if they're not tolerating statin, they really, there's Zetia, there's bile acid sequestrants, maybe in Clisaran, though I don't think payers are going to come around with that approval quite yet. What I will say is that in some of these primary prevention patients, CAC has helped. So we have um, been able to get PCSK9 monoclonal antibody inhibitors approved and primary preventions that have CAC in some cases. So, so always think about that if you're if you're running into um, if you're running into issues with LDL lowering and primary prevention. All right, so lipoprotein A. This is um, I shouldn't really call it the new kid on the block, but it's maybe like the, the more popular kid on the block right now. So we've known about LP little A for a long time. Um, what is it? So it's an LDL-like lipoprotein, um, but it has an APO lipoprotein A bonded to APO B100. Um, it's small, it's atherogenic, it gets into the blood vessel wall. 
Um, 90% of life approaching little a levels are inherited and they reach adult levels by age five. Um, it's estimated to be elevated in 20% of the population. So that's not a small number. It's an independent risk factor for ASCVD, so independent of LDL. Um, it also is causal in valvular aortic stenosis. Um, furthermore, environmental factors do not appear to impact levels, so there's not much to do from a, a lifestyle standpoint that can really put a dent in lipoprotein little a. Furthermore, statins do not affect levels. Um, niacin does decrease lipoprotein little a to some extent, but we all know that it does not affect cardiovascular disease outcomes, and currently it is not recommended as a treatment for high lipoprotein little A. PCSK9 inhibitors lower lipoprotein little A a little bit, maybe 17%, but I'll show you why that's probably not enough. So alkylate and secondary prevention, why do we care? So if we have somebody that we're already maximizing or optimizing treatment for secondary prevention, why do we care about lipoprotein little A? Well, what we've seen from uh, this pool, pooled analysis of seven RCTs was that um, elevated lipoprotein little a and statin treated patients still signifies increased risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. So it's something that we currently don't have a good treatment for, but it's causing problems. This is data from Odyssey. So remember, this is one of the PCSK9 monoclonal antibody inhibitor trials, the large trials, here they looked at the proportion of MACE reduction that was attributable to LDL versus like protein little a. And what you can see that in those with higher LP little a levels, um, some of that risk reduction, 27% of the risk reduction was related to lowering lipoprotein little a in these folks. So more reason why lipoprotein little a is a really hot target right now. Um, testing here in your clinics, if you're going to do it, um, pay attention to the units. So um, the, the majority of uh, professional societies prefer the nanomoles per liter. Unfortunately, we've got the other one here. We're working on changing that, but we've got the milligrams per deciliter assays at most of the freighter clinics. Um, so what is considered high, high or abnormal? So if it's over 50 milligrams per deciliter, or 125 nanomoles per liter. These levels correspond to the 80th um, percentile in um, populations which are predominantly Caucasian. African Americans and South Asians often have higher LP little a levels compared to Caucasians. Um, the testing does not require fasting. Results are affected by inflammation. So if somebody you know has a virus or a cold, or you know if somebody is actively in the hospital with a stroke or a heart attack, that's not the right time to test for lipoprotein little a. It'll be high because of inflammation. Um, but otherwise, it's a fairly easy test. I haven't had um, many issues in the last several years with with insurance not approving it. So you know, current guidelines suggest hey, at least test this once. Um, especially in patients with a personal or family history of premature coronary disease, because there is that, it's inherited, right? It comes from mom and dad. Um, some guidelines even say, consider testing at least once in everyone's lifetime. So in my clinic, I'm doing this almost in everybody, except maybe some of my older, older folks that are primary prevention still. But just about everyone I test at least once. I don't really retest after that. Um, because we don't have targeted therapies, but we will have them soon. So the interesting thing about, um, so LP little a, so it's not a bell-shaped curve like LDL, right? So it's a very skewed um, a curve in terms of uh, range of LP little a levels. So what this means clinically, um, I'll give you an example here on the right. So lowering LP little a 52 points, for example, is needed to achieve the same risk reduction to lowering LDL just 18 points. So we're more interested, you know, for treatments and, and medications that are gonna really, really drop those LP little a levels. You know, at this point, 50% reduction or 40% reduction that we do with LDL is, is not gonna be the same thing. So there are several investigative therapies um, on the horizon to lower lipoprotein little a. So in the box on the left here, there's injectable RNA-based therapies. These RNA-based therapies are really hitting the ground running. 
So there's a couple of different ones. There's antisense oligonucleotides, and then of course the small interfering RNA um, shown here are the couple examples of the different names of these drugs. And then on the right here, we actually have an oral um, small molecule inhibitor therapy that's um, being tested right now called Muvaloplin. Um, this was uh, just published, so this is just um, a phase phase two study of um, oral muvaloplin on LP little a um, activity, and they were able to achieve 60% reductions in LP little a with this oral medication, um, and that that was achieved after just 14 days of treatment. Opacerin, so this is um, a small interfering RNA. Um, similar to Enclisiran, right, except that it's targeting LP little a. Um, the phase two study is done. Um, look at these reductions, though. Um, so remember, 65% for the oral, the oral agent. This is an injectable one. 98% reduction in lipoprotein little a levels. So they are basically normalizing LP little a levels with this drug. Um, this is typically... Uh, Again, a three every three month injection, which is another um, uh, I think another uh, um, benefit, and um, efficacy and safety was shown in these phase two trials. Right now, there's um, a phase three trial ongoing. It's multi center. I'm I'm sad to say that we're not part of it. Um, however, there is many sites um, across the country, three sites in Chicago. So um, I have referred, um, I just referred my first patient to this um, outcomes trial um, at one of the Chicago locations. Um, he's a 48-year-old man that had an NSTEMI a few years ago, so in his early 40s, he has FH, um, and he has an LP little A level that meets um, requirements for this trial. So we'll see how that goes. I'll keep you posted. Um, I'll wrap up here very soon. Um, I know we didn't talk about um, triglycerides at all today. Um, it's just, a, it's a bit much, but regarding these um, mRNA um, technologies, um, there's also some that are under investigation for lowering triglycerides that target this um, ANG PTL3 um, protein. Um, so, so those are also on the horizon and the APOC3 as well. Um, but I think this this mRNA technology has really transformed um, the field of lipidology in a really good way. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and we're going to skip sand intolerance today. But I do just want to make sure that there are time for for questions. And then here's my here's my team. So I think most of you know Dr. Welsh. Um, she has clinic at Mequon and Freyer at West Bend. Maya Safarova just joined us in August. She's fantastic. She's interested in genetics and lipids, um, the genetics of premature coronary disease. Um, Aaron and Zach are phenomenal pharmacists that have been working with me since the beginning and are, are very good at managing um, lipids and stand intolerance. And then Lana Zaharova is my nurse practitioner um, that helps see a lot of my patients in follow-up when I'm not available. We also collaborate with Versity Blood Center for apheresis the genetics team um, for FH testing, and then um, nutrition services to help with plant-based diet, um, et cetera. Great. Thank you so much. Um, great talk. Uh, I see we already have one question. Uh, so Brad uh, was wondering with, with CAC scores, do they improve with statin therapy, and do you follow CACs after you start uh, therapy, such as statins? Oh, that's such a great question, Zach. Um, so. My rule of thumb, and I think a lot of us agree with this in um, cardiology, is that if the first CAC score is um, positive or abnormal, that there's really no role in repeating it. Part of the reason is that, um, remember, the CAC score only gives you the, the burden of calcified plaque. Now, we know that, we know from autopsy studies that and NCT coronary angiograms that most people have a combination of calcified and, and softer lipid-rich plaques, um, they often travel together. Um, but part of the way that these medications work um, is it depends on the stage of the, the, the plaque. So if the plaque is lipid-rich, you know, it may end up just making it more calcified, which stabilizes it and prevents it from rupturing. Um, or if it's early on um, in formation, then it can dissolve it a little bit. But what you'll end up seeing is that, you know, the CAC scores will likely go up 
partly because plaques are becoming more stable and more calcified on some of these therapies. And then the patient will just Great. be disappointed. <laughs> if you check and Great. it's going up, they'll be disappointed. Great. Uh, Joe, looks like you have a question. Uh, if you have a yeah, question, yeah, the, feel yeah, free to unmute. Is, Go ahead, Joe. Th this is Joe Shaker. Uh, thanks, Jacqueline. That was fabulous talk. And from someone who doesn't take care of patients with lipids and doesn't know much. But, I, you know, your first slide or one of the first slides about the 80 percent reduction is, is interesting. Is it really re prevention or delay? Because ultimately we die of something. And yeah. if it's a delay, is it 10 years? 20? In other words, of those 80 percent that we prevent, I assume that they're going to die of heart disease or stroke or something unless they get cancer at some point. Right. And how far is that delay? Or is that kind of, a, does that question make sense? It does. It absolutely makes sense. It absolutely does. Because yes, we all die of something. I think the, I, I think the goal, that's why, you know, I showed that, that life course of cardiovascular disease, because I really think the earlier that we can address these things, um, the better off the patient is, right? The earlier they can make those changes. And I think really the goal is not, it's not, quantity, right, of life, it's quality of life. And so I think, you know, even in, in older ages, um, meeting those, checking those eight boxes will still lead to to um, higher quality of life and, and probably less time on the, on the uh, you know, on the end, um, suffering and um, less time in the, in the, in those years of life that don't have um, very good quality. And I think, um, you know, the, the AHA, when they do their annual heart and stroke statistics um, report, um, that's kind of what they they um, they touch on, is more right. kind of quality of life. That's a great answer, right? And I think it makes complete sense. I have a quick follow-up question. That I don't want to take too much time up, but the dialysis patients, the studies oh. that I know of on statins have not shown efficacy. Yeah. Is that just because they just die no matter what? Oh, yeah, that's such a tough population. So you're, you're absolutely right. So um, there, the studies that have looked at statins and pri even primary prevention um, for dialysis patients have not shown benefit. And I think you're exactly right. I think some of that is competing risks. Um, so that being line infections um, or electrolyte derangements leading to other problems. Um, that's at least part of it. The other part of it is that even though we know that they, they develop coronary artery disease, you know, and a lot of calcification, I mean, a lot of calcification, it seems like it's a different process, right? And it seems to be more related to um, whatever is um, whatever is getting dialyzed through their system in a way. And so the formation of plaque in these patients appears to be different, right? Or from a different, a different process. And maybe that's also why statins aren't beneficial in that group. That's a good point. Uh, I know Denise has a lot of expertise in this, but they get calcification and actually ossification in their vessels. So I, I suspect it is different. Thank you. You're welcome. Jacqueline, this is Great. actually Denise, and I have a question for you. I started ordering more L to little A, but in some of my patients, insurance is denying, saying that it's an experimental assay. What can I do for that test to be covered? Oh gosh, that's um now the you know they won't they won't let you check it more than once oftentimes unless you know they're getting apheresis. By the way, LP little A can get apheresed off. Um but I maybe pay attention, Denise, for me if you don't mind, pay attention to which care insurance payers they have because at year ten years ago I was seeing um one one payer that was making it a problem. And, and then I haven't seen that in the last five or six years. Um, I think that they've come around. So I haven't had anybody not approve it. The other option, um, the other option is that you can um, write like a paper script or whatever, print off a paper script and have them go to some of these independent labs. And sometimes they can just pay $25 to get um, lipoprotein little A tested. Um, so that would be another option. I know at Freighter, um, they charge I think it's a hundred bucks. And so if, if it's not being covered, then that patient's gonna get a hundred dollar bill for lipoprotein little A. Yes, that's exactly the point. There were a couple of patients from Freighter UMR that is not being covered and they're mm -hmm. trying to appeal. So if you have any information that you can share with me how to help, 
please email that to me. I will. I'll look into that, Denise. And yeah, and certainly. So it's UMR. You said it's our own. It's our own. It's our own. Yes. Bummer. Okay. I'll look into that. Thank you. Great. Lisa, looks like you've got a question. Yes. Thank you very much for this great uh, review. That was really informative. I was wondering how often do you need to prescribe the higher dose of PCSK9 inhibitors? Because the patients don't have enough LDL reduction with the lower dose. Um, great question.